In part one of Predicate Logic Semantics, we looked at how to do English explanations to demonstrate properties that involve all interpretations, but we also focused exclusively on intentional interpretations that let us demonstrate certain particular things, like that an argument was invalid or that it was consistent. In this lecture, we're actually going to look at extensional interpretations, and we're going to try and generate extensional interpretations, often called models, that will demonstrate the very same things that an intentional interpretation did. Now, it turns out the reason why we want to look at extensional interpretations is because they can be quite easy to generate due to their sort of highly abstract nature. And if we struggle with this, we're actually going to finish with a technique very similar to a shortened truth table analysis that will help us break down our quantifiers so that we can really generate abstract, finite, extensional models quite easily to demonstrate properties that we're interested in. Recall that extensional interpretations use extensional definitions of predicates, which use set theoretic notation. And so we knew that we could just list out all the elements of predicates in the universe of discourse in a set, and that was an extensional interpretation waiting to happen. But the issue is, we didn't look at how to express higher place predicates. So when I look at the intentional definition of, say, F2, I can easily capture it as A is faster than B, for example. But how would I express that extensionally? How can I put all the members of the, into a set that captures the meaning of A is faster than B? Well, it's actually not so convenient. What I need to do is I need to rely on the idea of an ordered pair. And an ordered pair is just two things put together where a comma separates them inside round brackets, where the order matters. And these things, then, are what stand in my F relation. So if I want F to actually capture the idea that A is faster than B, I have to put every single ordered pair in the universe of things such that the left pair is faster than the right pair. So my set is clearly going to be infinite in size and just huge and just so unwieldy to write down. So here I have turtles, comma, slugs, dogs, ants, Usain Bolt, Alex Koo, and this is expressing that all the things in the left slot are faster than the right slot. Now, of course, order matters, so be careful. If turtles slugs is indeed true, if turtles are actually faster than slugs, then you can't put slugs turtle in because the order of the pairing matters. Now, this technique works as you move to higher order predicates. If you end up getting uh, F3, F4, F5, and so on, that's OK. You just move to an order, order triple, or an ordered four tuple, or an ordered five tuple, and so on. And so this system does work, but it's quite unwieldy. So why would we ever want to use it then if it's quite difficult to express even a two-place binary predicate extensionally? Well, it's actually only difficult if I have a very large universe of discourse. So here in this example we did last lecture, the universe of discourse within natural numbers. And I argued that that's actually pretty convenient because we can interpret this nicely, but it does make for extensional representation of this very hard. But then you might just wonder, do I really need an infinite universe of discourse to show that this argument is valid or invalid? Maybe I can actually just do this using a very, very small model, and in that case, extensional expression will be quite easy. So let's give that a shot. So here is an example of an intentional interpretation that captures that this argument is invalid. What I'm saying is the universe of discourse isn't infinite, it's only three things, Sarah, Nick, and Becky. A picks out Sarah or Becky, B picks out Nick, and F2 is the relation A likes B. Now the only way that this is actually invalid is if it's the case that Nick likes himself, Becky likes Nick, and no one else likes anyone else. So that means Sarah likes no one, no one likes Sarah, Becky doesn't even like herself, and so on. If this is true, then this argument is invalid. Because the first premise says, there is an A that doesn't like anyone. That's true, Sarah likes no one. The second premise says, there is a B who likes someone that's not an A. That's true, Nick likes himself. And the conclusion says the negation of something. Well, to show it's invalid, I need to show the conclusion is false, which suffices to show that this thing is actually not a negation. It's just for all x, bx. So what the conclusion actually says, if I want to show it's invalid, is that every B uh, is there is something that likes every B. And is that true? Well, yeah, Becky likes Nick, so it's done. Now, I don't really want to be con trying to convince you that this is the way the world is. In fact, I don't need to. I just need to show you and convince you that I've generated an interpretation such that if the premises are true, the conclusion can actually be false. And if that's done, I've shown that this is invalid.
So in fact, I don't actually need to worry about whether or not f represents something like liking. I can actually move to an extensional interpretation and really abstract away. UD, I just call SNB, A is the set of SB, B is the set of N, and then what's F? This is where it's really nice. I don't have to worry what F really means intentionally. I actually just give it the meaning purely based on the extensional definition of the term. That is to say, I list out all the ordered pairs, and the only ordered pairs are NN, BN. This interpretation, just like the previous one, renders this argument invalid, and that's good enough. Now I should take the level of abstraction one more, and I shouldn't use letters like SNB, that's a bit confusing. Instead what I'm just going to use, I'm just going to use placeholders. And the placeholders I'm going to use are the numbers, 0, 1, and 2, and so on. So what I've done here is generated an extensional interpretation. And in this interpretation, my universe of discourse has three members, and A, B, and F are defined like so. And this actually shows that there is an interpretation of A, F, and B under which this argument is invalid. These types of interpretations are sometimes called finite extensional models, or abstract models, or finite extensional abstract models, and so on. Um, and really, they're quite common in mathematics to show that certain things are invalid or certain things aren't true. So you might question whether or not I've actually done anything in terms of meaning. But remember, I have, because at the beginning of our first video on semantics, we talked about how you can bestow meaning and definitions extensionally as well as intentionally. And so I've just done it extensionally here. The thing is, and what's going to be difficult for some people at first, is to, it's hard to sort of stomach how abstract this process is, because we sort of construct these purely abstractly without trying to find a real-world analogous a definition of a term. But that's really actually an advantage here because I don't need to worry about the real world. I just come up with a system which will show the property I'm interested in and I can just tackle it one premise at a time. So here's an example. I want to create a finite extensional model or interpretation that shows this argument is invalid. All I have to do is look at what each premise means one at a time and the conclusion, and then construct a model as I go along. And I don't need to worry about a natural language interpretation here. I can just do this at a purely abstract level. So I set up my model. My interpretation just stipulates the definition of my universe of discourse, my F predicate, my G predicate, and my H predicate. OK, well, what does the first premise mean? It says there exists an x, fx, and gx. So it just says that there is something in my universe of discourse that is both f and a g. What? Well, let's start roughing in some parts. What I'll do is I'll stipulate that the universe of discourse has two members, for now. If I need to add a member, I've left the set open so I can add more in the future. No big deal. And what I'm going to say is I'm just going to let 0 be the member of my universe that is actually the thing picked out in premise 1. So 0 is both an f and a g. No problem. I've now made premise 1 true. Well, what do premise 2 and the conclusion say? Well, premise 2 says something generic stands in the h relation to all g's. And notice, I don't want to make the conclusion true, I actually want to make it false. So what's the negation of the conclusion? It's not the case, then, that something generic stands in the H relation to all Fs. Okay, well now I basically just have to pick and choose, make what I need true, make what I need false, etc. Okay, so first I'm actually going to throw 0, 0, the ordered pair 0, 0, into the H predicate. Why? Well, because that actually will make premise 2 true something generic stands in the H relation to all G's. Well, there's only one G that we have, and that's 0. So what I know is that I need 0 to appear as the second slot of an ordered pair in H. To something. Doesn't matter. And I've just arbitrarily picked that it's 0. If you had picked 1, that would also work. It doesn't matter. But if you look at the conclusion, I've actually done something wrong here. Suddenly, the conclusion is actually true, not false, and so I've screwed up. The conclusion says something generic stands in the H relation to all Fs. And actually, that is true right now. Zero stands in the H relation to all Fs. I don't want it to be true. I want it to be false. So I've sort of messed up here. So I just need to rig my system so that I still preserve premise 1 and premise 2 being true. And I make it so that the negation of the conclusion is also true, also known as making the conclusion false. So what do I do? Well, I take a close look, and I realize all I have to do is add something to f. Because if I add something to f, then I've made it that not all f's are 
a target of my H relation. They don't all stand in the H relation. So by adding one to my F predicate, I've succeeded in doing this, and so I've actually shown that this interpretation succeeds in demonstrating the invalidity of the argument. Now all I need to do to finish is just close out all the sets. I was keeping them open just in case I added anything, but now I'm ready to close it down. And this is how you generate a finite abstract model without really worrying about natural language interpretations. I just do a breakdown of the meaning and translate each individual premise and conclusion, figure out what I need to do, and then slowly go one premise at a time, making things true or false as needed. These types of finite abstract models can seem a bit uh, daunting and intimidating at first. Lots of you won't be used to working at this level of abstraction, but they really are an easier way of generating counterexamples than looking at uh, intentional interpretations. And the reason why is because it's sometimes just really hard to figure out a natural language predicate that captures the meaning of some of the weird sentences that we look at. So it's nice to be comfortable with this level of abstraction, and it's actually a very quick and easy way to identify when arguments are uh, misleading or invalid. Now you may also wonder how it is that I can just use a finite model and whether or not I can always use a finite model to demonstrate certain things, like invalidity. And it turns out that you can't. Uh, sometimes you actually do need an infinite model to demonstrate the invalidity of an argument. And how you could know ahead of time, well, that actually just takes a lot of practice. So there's no sort of tip I can give you to know ahead of time whether or not you need a finite or an infinite model. But I will tell you that I will never mislead you. So if I ask on a question for you to generate a finite model, it's not actually going to secretly be infinite in the end. Finite model questions for our purposes will be typically limited to uh, th around th two or three members of my universe of discourse, which make them nice and manageable for analysis and breakdown. So, if you do find this sort of challenging and difficult as you move on, there is a nice sort of more mechanical algorithmic way to come up with your finite abstract model, and that's the truth functional expansion. We've been talking a lot in the semantics section about meaning, and what do certain things mean, and what do the predicates mean, what do multiplicate predicates mean, and so on. But one thing we haven't asked is what the quantifiers themselves mean. And in asking that, we can actually do some sort of expansion. So the universal actually says something about all members of the universal discourse. That makes sense. It says for all. And the existential says for some, or for at least one member of the universal discourse, something about it, some property holds or whatever. And so what this lets us do is if we have a universal discourse that's extensionally stipulated, so for example here, my UD is 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., I can actually break this down. So if I have a statement that's universal, like for all xfx, what that really means is that f0 and f1 and f2 and f3 and so on must all be true. Because for all xfx says everything in my universal discourse must be true, so I can individually instantiate to each member and join them with a bunch of conjunctions, and that's what a universal means. A universal just means a bunch of ands that range over everything in my universe. Now likewise, I can do the same sort of basic trick with the existential. But the existential isn't saying that it's the case for everything, it's saying it's the case for at least one thing. And the natural way to interpret that is using the disjunction, or using or. So here, if, if there exists x, fx is true, then it's the case that f0, or f1, or f2, etc. is true. And remember, this is only for a universal discourse that's 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., etc. So what we can do is we can use this to expand sentences. And instead of having sentences that have quantifiers everywhere, we can actually blow them up and remove the quantifiers and put out logically equivalent sentences that are quantifier free and just have a lot of conjunctions and disjunctions in them. Now we would never want to do this on anything that had a large universe of discourse. Similar to truth tables, this is very practically limited by the size of our universe. And if our universe is infinite, we can never actually end up doing this. But this is a really nice technique when we want to analyze finite uh, universes, and that's also very handy when constructing finite abstract uh, extensional interpretations or models. So here's how we do it in practice. Let's do a truth functional expansion to a universe of two members, 0 and 1, of the statement for all x, fx, arrow, gx. So what I'm asking is what does the statement mean in terms of the universalness of it, given that my universe of discourse only has two things in it, 0 and 1. Well, remember, what it actually means is it's going to be a string of conjunctions. And the conjunctions are there because the main quantifier is the universal. 
And so I end up expanding it to each individual member of my universe of discourse, one at a time, and each time I do it, I join them with a conjunction. So my first universe of, member of my universe is zero, so I replace the x with zero, and then I say and, and I replace the x with one. Now this makes perfect sense. If everything that's an f is a g, well then it must be the case that if zero is an f, it's a g, and it must be the case that if one is an f, it's a g. I don't need to go any further because my universe of discourse only has two members. If it had a third member, no big deal, I would just add another conjunction at the end and say f2 arrow g2, and so on. Now truth functional expansions still have to preserve the main connectives. So here, in this sentence, I'm using an existential, but notice the main connective is still the negation. So when I expand it, I'm going to expand to each member of my universe of discourse, one at a time, and I'm going to put disjunctions between them, but I still need to make sure that the negation is out front. So I look at the negation first, then I look at the quantifier, and then I can come up with something that looks like this. And notice that the negation is out front modifying everything. Within the negation, the main connective is the disjunction, which makes sense because that disjunction is representative of the existential quantifier. What did I do to the inside? I expanded the sentence, and I did a substitution to 0, which is the first member of my universe. Then I did a substitution to 1, which is the second. And this is the truth functional expansion of this negation of existential. Now, when I have two quantifiers, uh, you can either choose to move outside in or inside out, but you just really need to do one quantifier at a time, and then it will make good sense. So here I'm going to move outside in, and I'm going to do the universal first. So if I do the universal first, I know that I should expand my sentence to my first member, 0, then my second member, 1, and in between I'll put a conjunction. So that's what I did here. The conjunction is the main connective of everything, uh, because the universal was the original main connective. So now I'm ready to expand. Let's do the left side first. I will now expand the existential. And so what I'm going to do is I'm only going to replace the y's, because the y's is what's bound to that existential, whereas in the first quantifier, uh, the universal, it was the x's that I replace. So I will expand that sentence. First I'll change all the y's to 0, then I'll put an or, then I'll change all the y's to 1. And so that's what I get. Notice that the and is still the main connective. I've just done the left conjunct. Doing the right conjunction is the exact same thing. I replace all the y's with 0, and then I replace all the y's with 1. And this will make the OR the main connective of the right conjunct. So when you do a truth functional expansion with nested quantifiers, it's fine. You just go one at a time, and everything sort of expands exactly as you would expect. You can always check to make sure you did it right just by a quick analysis of the main and subconnectives. Here's a truth functional expansion uh, for the existential, but what's interesting is that I have a negated quantifier inside the scope, so not even modifying the entire thing. So again, I can choose to go inside or out or outside in. I typically like to go outside in, but it doesn't matter. And so I'll expand the existential first. When I expand this existential, I'm going to get a conjunction, sorry, a disjunction, and first I'll replace all x's with 0, then I'll replace all x's with 1. And you can see that this expansion plays out exactly as we expect. Now what I need to do here is expand each universal, but I'm probably just going to do them one at a time so that I don't cause any confusion. Now take a look here. I only ever expand what is under the scope of the quantifier. So I'm not going to expand the f0 and the negation. I only expand the g0y. So first I replace the y with a 0, then I replace it with a 1, and I put an and in between, and I get this. Notice I still only have the 1 f0 and, as well as the negation is the main connective modifying that conjunction that I have highlighted there. I do the exact same thing on the right side with this right connective, and I end up getting the following of the exact same form, and this then is my full truth functionally expanded statement. Why is this helpful? Because using this truth functional expansion allows us to create abstract finite models quite easily. Let's show that this argument is invalid. So the first thing you would have to do is actually do the correct truth functional expansion of this. I strongly suggest you pause the video now and go ahead and write it out and do the truth functional expansion. I'm not going to do it all step by step. The next slide will just have the solution ready for you. So give it a shot. Here's the solution in terms of the truth functional expansion. 
Now notice this doesn't really look much at all like my original statements, but that's okay. It's because there's no quantifiers, and I've expanded it to the universe of two members, 0 and 1. So now I want to make this thing invalid. So what I do is I set up a table and I get ready to go. This table has every single possible element in there. 0, 1, whether or not it's an F, whether or not it's an H, and then the four possible combinations for a two-place predicate G. Now if I want to show that this argument is invalid, I need to set premise 1 true, which means this disjunction needs to be true. I need to set premise 2 true, which means this negation needs to be true, and of course that means that this disjunction needs to be false. And finally, I need the conclusion to be false. So let's just go one step at a time and see if we can actually make this the case. So let's focus on premise 1. I want to make this disjunction true. Well, what does it mean to have a disjunction true? Well, it just means that I need one of the disjuncts to be true. I don't care which one. I'm just going to randomly pick the left disjunct. If you want to pick the right one, you'll still get a perfectly reasonable answer. So if I want the left disjunction to be true, well, I just need to look at it. What does it mean for this to be true? Well, this is actually a series of conjunctions. So if I want this to be true, I need everything in here to also be true which means F0 needs to be true, G00 needs to be true, and G01 needs to be true. So when I look down here, I know it must be the case that F0 is true, G00, G01, they're true, and I indicate that in my table. Okay, if that's the case, I've made premise 1 true. Now let's look at premise 2. Remember it's a negation, so that really means I need the disjunction to be false. But how do I make a disjunction false? Unfortunately, it means I need both sides to be false. But this actually isn't so bad, because each side of the disjunct is a, a conjunction itself, which means that I only need to very cleverly pick one conjunction on each side, and even of those, I just need to pick one aspect of that conjunction. And if I just force these two random things that I pick to be false, that will render the entire disjunction false as well. Now this is sort of neat. You might wonder why did I pick H0 instead of something else? Well, it doesn't really matter. You can actually see that I can't pick uh, G00 or G01 to be false because they've already been made true by premise 1. So I actually ended up just picking the only thing I had an option of making false, which is H0. And then I, could I have made H1 false? Sure, but you know, I just pick this randomly and we'll see where it takes us. Sometimes you have to go back and forth and manipulate it to see if you're actually on the right track. Sometimes you'll make a mistake and you need to go back and fix it. But still, this is quite mechanical. It's sort of just like a little logic puzzle. So I'm going to set H0 and G10 to be false in my interpretation. The last step is that I need to make the conclusion false, which means this and needs to be false. Well, that's pretty easy. I just have to pick one of the conjunctions and make it false. I pick this one, and that's also pretty easy. I just need to pick one of these things to make false, and the easy option is H1. So I could make it that H1 is false, and there I'm done. What if I picked not G11 to be false? I could have done that too, and that would actually mean that G11 is true, and I could have done it that way. The point is, the choice doesn't matter. There's lots of different interpretations of this, which will show that this is invalid. OK, so now that I have my table, how do I put it together to show this is invalid? It's actually quite straightforward. I just actually have to write this in set theoretic notation. Notice I've already stipulated the universe of discourse is 0, 1. f is just the singleton of 0. h is empty. And g2 has to include 0, 0 and 0, 1. Now you might ask, what about f1? Should I put 1 in f or not? Well, it turns out what this means is that you can put 1 in f if you want to or not, and it will not affect the invalidity of the argument. Same with putting 1, 1 into g. Now because of this, I typically recommend you don't bother. Don't put anything in unless you need to, but if you did, it wouldn't make it wrong. That's it for predicate logic semantics. Uh, some of the skills are going to be seem a bit odd. We started off with the ones that had the closest tie to our natural language, which were intentional interpretations and English language explanations. And we finished with things that were quite highly abstract. Those were extensional interpretations, particularly finite and extensional interpretations. And we looked at a truth functional expansion so that we can generate those nice finite models quite easily. Now, if you're not quite comfortable with the abstract stuff, it just takes a bit of time to get used to, but they're actually quite easy, and it's a really nice shortcut to understanding what certain sentences say. Now, there's only one thing missing, then, in terms of connecting our course together, and that is actually the relationship between semantics 
and uh, derivations, which is something we've never really talked about. So you might wonder, how is it that I can do certain things in semantics and certain things in derivations? And what is the relationship between, say, truth and meaning and these sort of very formulaic derivation systems that we've been manipulating all along? That's actually a pretty complicated question, and we'll address that soon.